So now we're going to look at visual displays of variables that are quantitative. Quantitative meaning they are numbers. And before, the two types of displays we looked at were bar charts and pie charts. Both those were for categorical variables. And now we're going to look at ways to display quantitative variables. So these are going to be a little bit different because quantitative variables like height is a quantitative variable. Height is measured as a number or age or weight or number of rooms. These are all quantitative variables. So here's a quantitative variable. We have data from 50 households and the numbers that we have, which we have 50 of, are the number of available cars in that household. So I guess that's like how many cars they have sitting around that they can use. Do we have some zeros here? That looks like the smallest. Goes up to five, that's the biggest. And we have 50 numbers because we took a sample of 50 households. And what they ask us to do is to construct a frequency and relative frequency distribution. We've done examples of both of these types of distributions. The basic process is going to be the same. If you want to get some practice, you could pause this video and use this data set and make the frequency and the relative frequency distributions. So like I said, if you want to try making both these distributions, you should have paused the video by now because, spoiler alert, we are about to show you the answers. So here we go. So here are the frequency and relative frequency distributions. These are the possible values in the first column here, the number of cars. Third column we see here are the frequencies and the fourth column are the relative frequencies. So there are, if you want to think about the totals here, they were 50 households represented. All these relative frequencies should always add up to one. They might not be perfect sometimes due to a bit of rounding. This might be a number that's close to one. That's okay, that just comes from rounding. A histogram is a way to visualize a quantitative variable you see histograms quite a bit when people want to display data. And they're similar to bar charts, but we said that bar charts are for categorical variables and histograms are for quantitative variables. What we're going to do is we're going to have these things that are called classes. How high the bars are is the number of observations in each of these classes. So you can just sort of think of these classes as categories. Sometimes we call these bins. We're basically just going to maybe stuff a bunch of or like a range of values in classes. And then we're just going to count how many observations are in each class. That's going to be what a histogram looks like. So let's just look at a real simple one right now with that same distribution for the number of cars per household data. So here is that histogram. I know it doesn't look super impressive right now. It's just a very basic histogram. We are displaying a numeric variable here. And a big difference is that there's no spaces between these bars. They are right next to each other. And that's demonstrating that this is because we're dealing with a numeric variable. We have no gaps in our range of these numbers. Everything falls into a certain category and there's also an order to these categories. So zero would usually come first and one and two. So the fact that we don't put spaces between them indicates that we're dealing with a different type of variable. We're not dealing with distinct categories like we did before, but we're dealing with numbers that have a natural order and a natural progression. It's worth noting that histograms, just like bar charts, have different possibilities for the y-axis. They might have frequencies, just the counts. They can also show the relative frequencies, the proportions. So just because you're looking at a histogram, you still want to make sure you look at the type of numbers that you're seeing here in the vertical axis. Are these counts we're seeing or are they proportions? So we mentioned previously that when you're making histograms, instead of having bars, those separate things that have different heights are called the classes. What these things are 
are not necessarily just individual values like blue or green. They could be a range of values, like every single number between 0 and 5. And then the next class could go from 5 to 10. And the next could go from 10 to 15. These are intervals of numbers. And sometimes we have to do that with a histogram. You'll see these bars include a range of numbers, not just one individual value. So let's look at an example of a type of data where we'll need to create some classes that end up being intervals. Here's a pretty famous data set that is got 45 values in it. And what are these? They're the eruption time of Old Faithful Geyser in Wyoming. That's in Yellowstone National Park. It's pretty awesome. And what we're actually looking at right now are the time between eruptions. If you haven't been to Yellowstone, I highly recommend it. Seriously. So let's take a look at how we're going to need to create our classes so that we can look at a display of this data. Those 45 values we just looked at, the smallest one was 672 and the largest one is 738. We're going to make our first class here be a nice even number that's below our lowest data value. So we're going to go to 670. And the interval we're going to use for this first class is going to start at that value and it's going to end at 679. So that is going to be the very first class we're going to use. And it's important that you make these things the same width you'll notice that this thing is 10 wide. There are 10 numbers that are included here. You can count them if you don't believe me. Start at 670 and end at 679. So basically, we just want to make all our classes be this same width until we've gone at least as high as we need to until 738. So the next one is going to start at 680. That's going to be the lowest value, and it's going to end at 689 that has the same width as this earlier one. And so basically we've created a pattern here that we just need to be careful and follow where we go up by 10 every time and we just need to keep going until we are at our highest data value. Okay, so I kind of cheated a little bit and went ahead and just wrote the ranges out for all of our classes. So all we need to do is just go back to our data and count how many end up in each of these intervals. So, okay, here is that work done for us. We have the classes we just made up here and we have the counts for each of them as tally marks. They're just showing you this because it might be a nice way if you're actually creating these on your own. Tallying is a good way to count things. But then we have the numbers as frequencies as well and also as relative frequencies. So let's go ahead and look at these in a histogram. So here's the table that we just looked at as a histogram. And the variable here, like we said, is the time between eruptions and that's in seconds. And the first histogram we're looking at is the frequency histogram. And you'll notice that we have our various classes down here, like 670 to 679, 690 to 699. And then the height of these corresponds to how many individuals were in each class. So you'll notice here that there is no height here, which means there were no values in this class, or I could say in this interval. Interval sounds a little bit less weird to me than class. So histograms are ways to visualize quantitative variables to look at distributions. And there are a few distribution shapes that have special names. We see them so often. First one is the idea of what we call a uniform distribution, one that is spread out evenly across all the values. For example, say you had a six-sided die, one of these things that you play Monopoly with that has the little dots on it, and say you rolled that a thousand times, that would take a long time but it's possible, and you made a histogram of all those results, we would expect to see something like this where we have our classes would be each of the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. The heights we would expect would be fairly similar this dice has an equal probability of landing on each number. So it wouldn't necessarily be perfectly even, but it would be pretty uniformly spread. That is a uniform distribution. The next important shape of distributions that we'll see is one we're going to call 
a bell-shaped distribution, one where we've got the largest amounts in the middle. What happens on the outsides is the thing gets smaller. It tails off as you go left and right. So what that would look like is something like this where we have a kind of a mound shape and outside of that mound it gets smaller and smaller. Oops, these should all be equal if I was a better artist. So this is the type of distribution that we're going to call a bell-shaped distribution. You might see this if you were looking at a lot of different variables actually. If you got a bunch of humans' heights together, they would tend to be grouped around a middle number and trail off towards the ends. Lots of variables have a bell-shaped distribution. So the uniform distribution and the bell-shaped distribution are both examples of what we would call symmetric distributions. They are even, they have symmetry, they're symmetric. And there are two types of not symmetric distributions called a skewed right distribution and a skewed left distribution. So the bell shape and the uniform shape have a nice evenness to them. The skewed distributions are going to be not symmetric. So I remember these names by thinking that the right and left is where the sort of tail of this distribution goes to. A skewed right distribution is going to have a lot of values in the left part of it, and then it's going to have this tail that trails off to the right. As the definition says, the tail is to the right. So this is, again, a skewed right distribution. So a skewed left distribution, instead of having the tail pointing to the right, a skewed left distribution is going to have a larger number of values on the right, and it's going to trail off as it gets smaller. This is a skewed left distribution. So I just, again, remember where the tail's pointing. Skewed left distributions are sort of pointing to the left, and skewed right distributions are pointing to the right. Income has a skewed right distribution. There are a lot of people that have a lower income, and as you talk about rich people, there are fewer numbers of people. I'm being a little bit short here. What this vertical axis really is the frequency. I'm showing frequencies on both. Here is your book giving four slightly more professional looking examples of the shapes that we just talked about that are important distributions that we see quite a bit.